All right, parents, especially grandparents, uh, I know you've seen this, uh, maybe even this year, even though we're only two days out from Christmas. How long does it take for the thrill to wear off the presents for the young ones? Until the next present. Until the next present, that could be, yeah. How long does it take before they, they get used to whatever it was that they were so entranced by and excited about and then get shoved in a corner. And you know, it's not just the kids. Uh, there's definitely the adults have an element of that. It's funny, I was talking with a guy at a knife shop the other day, and uh, you know, he's talking about this knife with a certain mechanism of opening and closing. He said, yeah, you know, in general, you won't do it too often after those first few days when you sit at your chair, just opening and closing it. I'm like, yeah, I know how that is. New knife, you just sit there, and after a while, you get used to it. You know, what determines how long the thrill last? Is it the expense of the gift? Uh, you know, how much they, they wanted, how many gifts they had maybe, or we had? You know, is it the, the size? You always go for those big presents when you want to open something. And what is it that determines that? I don't know, but we've all seen it, definitely in others, and I would say in ourselves as well. well on a related note, how long did it take you to get used to God? If you have it personally accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've had your sins forgiven, you know heaven awaits you, how long did it take for you to get used to God? How long should it take before you get used to God and the thrill wears off? Never. 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 Stop and think about it. How, how could you ever get used to a relationship with the creator of the universe. You know, do, you ever, do you ever ask yourself, is this all there is to the Christian life? And maybe you look at other people, perhaps in the past you've read about, or other people you see and like, wow, it just looks like God is so alive and active in their lives, or they're doing so much, and you say, is, is this all there is? You know, stop and think. If our relationship with the creator of the universe is boring, wouldn't you consider that a problem? When you say that, that, it shouldn't be this way. And if there is a problem, where do you think the problem lies? Is God not living up to his responsibilities? You know, I was not planning on preaching this sermon today. As I told you last week, I wanted to do one passage before Christmas uh, in the Bible, because it was the Sunday before and then the Sunday a little after. And I thought, all right. And so last week we looked at the story of the angel Gabriel appearing to Simeon and telling him you're going to have this son, John the Baptist. And then I said, we're going to look at something that happened shortly after Jesus' birth when he's presented at the temple. Well, I began looking at that passage and there was something then that, that struck me that I saw one verse in particular. After Mary and Joseph had arrived at the temple to do this thing, present Jesus because he was the firstborn son and there were, God had told the, the Jews that the firstborn belonged to him ever since the exodus and so they would present him in an offering and sort of buy back the son and it, when they get there there's this man Simeon and uh, did I say Simeon before I did? Yeah, it was uh, Zechariah before. Simeon was going to be today. Simeon, he had been told by God through the Holy Spirit, you will not die until you see the Messiah, this long-awaited Messiah. And that day, the Holy Spirit, it says, led him to the, the temple, directed him to Jesus. He took Jesus and, and he pronounced th this blessing. And among it, he said, you know, this child is going to be a light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory to, for Israel. And right after that, it says in chapter 2, verse 33, and his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And at first when I read that and took some notes, I thought, well, why? <laughs> why did they marvel? How could they marvel? After all that they had seen prior to this, some guy just comes up and, you know, makes a pronouncement. Now, granted, you know, there's something involved there, but they'd seen angels, all this stuff. And I thought, why would they marvel at that? And then I realized, why shouldn't they marvel at that? Should you ever, no matter what you've seen, should you ever stop marveling when you see God do something else? Because notice this word marvel, it doesn't mean surprised. One of the point today is that we should stop being surprised when God acts in our lives. We should realize that's what he does. He acts in our lives. And so we should not be surprised, but this word marvel, it means the Greek word means to regard with amazement, 
So that's the first part. And then with a suggestion of beginning to speculate on the matter. When you marvel at something, what this word meant, again, you're amazed, but then you also begin to wonder, what's up? Why is this happening? In terms of God, what's God doing? What's he want to do? The, the short definition includes the word admire, but then also wonder. Wonder. What is God doing? And so marvel, this word has both sides, amazement and wonder about what is God doing. And when I saw that, I realized that word wonder is very frequent in the first couple chapters of Luke. It's not just one word that appears once, and there's varying degrees when we're, we're going to look at these. Sometimes it's more amazement and less like, what's up? Sometimes it's more, what's up? Less amazement, but they're there, and it's a continuing theme here. Some translations have it at times as wonder. Some have it as marvel. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. The first one we saw last week. You remember Zechariah goes into the holy place to burn the incense, something that priests did twice a day. It was his chance. He got picked. Well, outside, every time this would happen, people that had gathered in the temple would pray because the incense symbolized the prayers going up to God. So they would pray. And it says in chapter 1, verse 21, the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. Didn't usually take that long. A person would go in, offer the incense, didn't have a conversation with an angel. At this point, they didn't know what had gone on. When he came out, he was unable to speak, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. But there's the first time that word occurs. And then later on, we didn't get to this part, but later on when John the Baptist is born, you remember, Zechariah can't speak. <laughs> because he had asked the angel Gabriel, how do I know for sure this whole baby thing's going to happen? And Gabriel's like, really? <laughs> I'm an angel. <laughs> I stand in the presence of God. Here's how you'll know. You won't be able to speak until he's born. And so Zechariah couldn't speak, and the child is born, and all the, the people from the village that knew them, they say, well, you're going to name him Zechariah, right? And she, Elizabeth says, no, I'm going to name him John. I'm like, what's up? <laughs> Why would you do that? Zechariah, we know you can't speak, but here's a tablet. Tell us what you're really going to name this child. And he writes John. And then it says... And he reread that, 163, he asked for a writing tablet, he wrote, his name is John, and they all wondered. They all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. So that's that same word there. There's an element of, you know, what's up? There's definitely, they knew what had happened before, too. You know, they knew the story that this couple was way older than they're supposed to be. They've been trying to have kids. There was something unique, special about this. And so there's a little bit of amazement. A little bit of what's up. Well, then the, the next time this word occurs, it's after Jesus has been born. And you remember Mary and Joseph, they go to Bethlehem because of the census, and there's no room in the inn, so they're out in the stable. Jesus is in a manger. Well, then an angel appears to the shepherds on the outskirts of town and tells them, you know, again, that the son of David has been born. And then a host of angels appears and begins singing. He says, go in and see the child. And so the shepherds go in and not only see the child, they tell Mary and Joseph and apparently some other people gathered there about this whole angel thing. Yeah, an angel came and told us this and a whole group of them are singing. And yeah, it's pretty amazing. Chapter 2, verse 18, and all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. You, you, you can see there's an element of amazement there. Wow, angels. Angels appeared to you. What's this mean? They wondered. And then the verse that was in the passage I was going to focus on today, once again, his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And uh, all the translations have marveled here, but Young's literal translation does say we're wondering. It's the same word. In each of those occasions, it's the exact same word. And sometimes the translators think, oh, it's a little bit more wondering, sometimes a little more marveled. Well, it's all of that. It's an element of amazement combined with an element of wondering. And so there's this theme four times in two chapters. And it's not just that. There, there's something else that's related that we see in these couple chapters three times. Back when John the Baptist is born, right after they ask, you know, what are you going to name him? And Zechariah writes John, and then he can speak again. So another miracle has happened. Miraculously, after nine months... 
It says in chapter 1, verse 65, and fear came on all their neighbors. <laughs> all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And so you see the hand of the Lord. They're amazed. What will this child be? They're, they're wondering. And then the phrase I, I've got bolded there, they laid them up in their hearts. This wasn't just something they passed by. You ever you pass by something, I wonder what that is, and you just keep going? No, they, they wondered. They, they laid them up in their hearts. They, kept, they thought about it more after this. There's another time, probably the, the best known instance of this, we associate with Mary. You remember after the shepherds came and all they said, chapter 2, verse 18, all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Verse 19, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Oh, look up that word ponder. It, it, it seems to go even deeper. It, it means to consider, to confer with oneself. And talk it over in your own head. What could this mean? I don't know I, all this. But that idea of she treasured up all these things in her heart. All these things, not just the angels appearing to the shepherds, but you go back. The angel Gabriel appearing to her, and she knew an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. And this whole census, she had to have been wondering, you know, how are we going to avoid everyone in Nazareth, you know, putting two and two together about this? When we got married, when the baby came, all those things she treasured in her heart and she, she pondered, she wondered about. And then a passage I wasn't going to look at, but it's still in this account of things before Jesus becomes an adult and reaches, starts his ministry. You remember when Jesus is 12, they, they go to Jerusalem for one of the feasts, and they leave, Mary and Joseph leave, and they assume Jesus is with them in the caravan somewhere with some other family or friends. And so they get out of town, and then they begin checking, where's Jesus? He's not with them. And so they go back. And you remember where he was, he's in the temple. And he's talking and exchanging, you know, ideas with the, the religious leaders of the day, and he's keeping up with them. And Mary and Joseph ask about it, and Jesus says, Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? In chapter 2, verse 50, they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. There again, his mother treasured up all these things. And you can see from what all, th all three of those passages are, Luke's, you know, I don't need to say it every time, do I? He, treasured means she, she pondered them. She wondered about them. She was amazed at these things that were out of the ordinary. What do they mean? What do they mean? Well, last week I said that, you know, the big picture as we look at the beginning of Luke here is that God is planning something big. You remember, that's what Luke is saying in these opening chapters. Listen, God, you know, when it was happening, something big is happening. As he's writing to his audience, he's letting them know this is something big that you now know about that is spreading. Something big was happening then, and something big is happening now. You know, God, his three main works are creating, sustaining, and redeeming. Well, he's already created, that's done, and only he sustains the world, keeps the world spinning, but when it comes to redeeming, buying man back from that, the bondage of sin, restoring that relationship, ever since God promised in Genesis 3.15, I'm going to do it, people have played a part. And that's our part. God wants to do something big, and it all focuses around that. It did then, as we read in Luke. That's what the people were involved with. It's what God wants to do in our lives. And so we said last week, really the theme of Luke is that God's plan is to use committed followers, disciples, to help make committed followers. That's what Luke's telling them. Here's what God is doing. I'm giving you the details, but this is what it means. This is what we need to carry on. And last week, we looked specifically at God wants to do big things through us, wants to include us in that. But there's a couple qualifications. We must be fully committed, and it will be different than we expect. We must be fully committed, and we said committed means two things. It means that we're obedient. We saw that with Zechariah and Elizabeth. They were, they were righteous and blameless before God. But then you also have to be full of faith, faithful in the sense not of the faithful, obedient side, but the faithful, trusting God, believing God. That's where Zechariah fell short when he says, Hey, Gabriel, give me a sign that shows me this is really going to happen. And Gabriel said, You should have believed. Here's your sign. 
you won't be able to speak. And so we need to be those. That, that's what qualifies us. We need to be fully committed. And we said it's going to be different than we expect. That, that is a huge theme throughout these opening chapters. No one expected these things. Ga or Zachariah didn't expect to meet an angel in there. Mary didn't expect to get pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Joseph didn't expect that to happen to his wife. They didn't expect the census. All of this. It's not what we expect. And so that's really the qualifications. I have to be committed and have to be open to whatever it is God has. Well, today the focus isn't on being qualified for those big things. It's being aware of big things. And what, what if I am qualified and I just got no clue what's going on? No clue what God wants to do. And you might think, well, hey, if they're really big things, how can you miss a big thing? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, they don't always start off big. God's big things don't always start off big. We saw chapter 1, verse 21, the people were waiting for Zechariah and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. From their perspective, it was just hmm, something a little strange. Why is he taking longer than most people do? They had no idea. This was the start of something big. The birth of the, the forerunner of the Messiah was being announced right then. They didn't know that. They don't always start off big. And also, it's not always clear at first what God is planning. In other words, what these things mean. There's things happening, but what's it mean? Chapter 1, verse 65, it said, Again, the fear came on all the neighbors, and all these things were talked about through the hill country of Judea, and all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. They could tell God is doing something. We don't know what. <laughs> what's this child going to be? So sometimes we don't know at first what God is doing, and we definitely don't know what's our part in all this. God, I can tell you're doing something. I'm not sure what it is, and I don't know what you want me to do. But everything in the Bible says you do want me to do something because that's how you work. <laughs> you work through us to do these big things. I need to be committed. I need to be expecting what I don't expect. But I might not see it. I might not know what it is right away. And so the, the question for today is, have I gotten used to God? Have I lost my sense of wonder? And because of that, I don't see God working at all to even begin to see what's unfolding and what my part is. And so two key ideas today. First of all, we need to recognize God working. <laughs> Pretty basic, isn't it? And again, part of us might say, well, God, if you would do an out outright miracle, I'd have no problem recognizing it. You know, if you just walk, send someone to walk on some water or part some seas, I, that one I would get. God, I'd have no problem. Well, you know what? God doesn't always do that. He doesn't always work in miracles, even in the Bible. You look throughout the Bible, and there are periods when there are a lot of miracles, but it's not like every person who lived in Bible time saw a miracle. There are whole generations of people that didn't see what is, you know, literally the, the definition of a miracle, the suspension of the laws of nature. They didn't see that. It didn't happen. But God was always working. That part was true. God was always sustaining for sure. But once again, that's just a God thing. You know, you and I have nothing to do with spinning the earth and make sure it's on the right, you know, degree of access and all those things. That's not us. But when it comes to redeeming, from the very beginning, God was working through people and in people and with people. We need to recognize that. You know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, she has a quote that I love. She says, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck blackberries. Isn't that awesome? Earth is crammed with heaven. She's saying there is supernatural. There is God working all around us. She says, every common bush is a fire with God. It's not just that one bush, that one day with Moses that was burning. Every bush, if we just stop, God's doing something. We need to recognize God working. First of all, we need to recognize it in the Bible. You know, how much of God working in the Bible do we really see? How much of it? We can read the Bible, but I think so often we miss it. I, I think about the Bible study we did in Genesis. And you know what? I have been in and around church for my whole life. <laughs> I mean, literally, the first Sunday of my life, about 49 years ago, I was in church. I have a, a 
bachelor's degree in Bible, a master's degree in theology. But as I sat down with you all this Tuesday nights and went through Genesis, I was just amazed to just stop and look at like, wow, if everything those people did, some of them, you know, just totally contrary to God once, some of them oblivious, all these different things, yet God worked through all those. He was working. And it's just amazing. It gave me new insight into the genealogy. It's like, uh, why would you even include these genealogies? You know, the beginning of Matthew, we saw it. Well, it's because those Jews knew their Old Testament so well that every time you know, Matthew's listing the, the son of, the son of, they're like, well, I know his story. Wow, God used that guy? <laughs> well, God worked through that? God was able to overcome his? All that stuff, it, it's there. How much of it do we see as we read through the Bible? And, of course, that brings up the issue to see it, we have to read it. To see what's in the Bible, you've got to be in the Bible. You've you got to look at it. You've got to spend time reading it because God is there and he's working. It says in Psalm 139, David writes, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. David says, God, you're always with me. You're always aware of me. You're always working in my life, no matter what the situation. So it's there in the Word, but it's also happening now. Are you aware of God working in your life right now? Do you realize, do you, do you stop and see, and again, you know, these threads, I, I tell you, you look for something where you see these things that just a little catches your attention, and then another one, and another one, and you see there's a theme, there is pointing in a certain direction, it's indicating something, you maybe talk with some friends, God's working there, you know, and maybe it's just in general how you can look back and say, wow, you know, I, I've seen God work in my life. You know, I would ask you this morning, what did it take to get you here this morning? You might say, well, seven snoozes and my, you know, spouse, you know, pushing me, three cups of coffee or, <laughs> you know. No, I mean, how is it that you are here in, in this clubhouse at Transforming Life Christian Church? You know, how is it that, you know, I think everyone started at Scottsdale Christian Church. How did you get there? How did things happen? You know, how did you get here? And you might say, well, you know, you'd always be somewhere if I had made this choice instead of that choice. Granted, I wouldn't be here, but I'd be somewhere. Okay, where? Where would you be? You know, whatever led you, if you made a decision for Christ, what led you there? Where would you be without that? Just stop and think about God working in our lives. That, that's the first thing. I need to recognize, <laughs> need to realize God still works today. He doesn't necessarily walk on the water or part the waters or whatever that is. But boy, he's working. He's working in my life. And I look back on it, maybe I realize all these things I've missed. Wow, God, if that hadn't happened, and that hadn't happened. Oh, my, if I hadn't done this instead of that. Recognize God is working. And then the second thing, idea, we need to recognize that God is working. We need to marvel at God working. And again, that word has those two elements. First of all, there's amazement. You know, no matter how many times we read a Bible story, should we ever get used to it? Should we, should we ever get used to, oh yeah, I know that story. Yeah, I know how that one ends. No. No. I mean, a good story in general. You go see a movie about Titanic. We all knew what was going to happen. <laughs> but we're thinking, this could be a good movie. And people went back and saw it. We're talking here about the Bible. <laughs> this word from God. You know, I said, we had a series actually, and I said the key questions in life, the first key, key question is, is there a God or not? You know, really, that determines, I mean, that separates people into two distinct groups. You either believe there is a God or you deny there's a God. Well, if I believe there's a God, then the next question is, is the Bible his word or not? You know, has this God who's there, as he's spoken, has he conveyed his will to us? Is the Bible his word? And then, if I believe the Bible's his word, and I've added one since our series, and I think it's necessary, will I submit to God whatever he says? And before I know what he says, just in general, will I submit to him whatever it is? If so, then what does it say? 
that's when I find out, okay, what does the Bible say? What does God say, this God creator? Well, that's, again, those are really the four essential questions for, for life. But just stop at first and say, is there a God or not? Yes. Is the Bible his word? If you say yes, stop and think about that. And here's one time I regret that I, I use a tablet instead of a Bible because I can't hold up a Bible, but I can hold up like 20 Bibles in here. I can flip through them <laughs> if we had Wi-Fi. I have the words of God. I have this book that tells me what the God of the universe has done in history, in the lives of people, what he's done to build up to right now for me. I have this book that, that has his very words in it, quotations from God. Isn't that amazing? Shouldn't we just like, wow, and now I can get it on my phone. <laughs> I have it with me all the time now. God's word. That's unreal. That's absolutely amazing. Hebrews said, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's what the Bible is. And again, I've got it in my back pocket all the time. Take it out and read it. And you know what? If I'm really amazed, will, will I have any trouble finding time to read it? If I truly am amazed that I have the Word of God, I should be able to find time to read it. You know, I, it should be amazement at God working. And it's the same with God working in our lives. Again, you, you might think, well, I w wouldn't get used to it if God would just do, you know, write on the wall. If God would just, you know, speak out loud, I wouldn't get used to that. Okay, you can't blame me for getting used to this other stuff. Well, no. You think about people who saw God work and heard his voice. The Israelites in the wilderness always come to mind. They got used to it. They had no problem ignoring it. So it's not that. We often want to say, because we haven't experienced that, can we say, oh, I'd be different if it was for that. No, we wouldn't be. So let's just deal with what we have. <laughs> the way that God works in our lives. You know, in some ways, God working through providence is even more amazing than working through a miracle. Now, miracles are great. And what's the difference between providence and a miracle? I, always used to, I like to use the, the wedding feast. You know, when Jesus, they ran out of wine, and Jesus miraculously turned water into wine, that's a miracle. That's suspending the laws of nature. Water doesn't turn into wine. You know, you said it there, it doesn't happen. Providence would have been when they run out of wine, a wine merchant comes by on a cart full of wine, and he says, hey, I've got this extra wine. I, I'm, I just have no way to sell it. Get rid Can you guys use it? Right at the very moment they needed it. That'd be like, wow, that's not just a coincidence. That's providence. See the difference there? Well, as miraculous and wonderful as miracles are, you know what? Again, God suspending the laws of nature, God turning water into wine. The, the water didn't say, no, I don't want to. <laughs> but how many times in our lives are we like, no, I don't want to. And God doesn't force us. And sometimes we don't do what he wants us to do, but he's still able to work in our lives. That, that's more amazing in some ways, God doing that. And, and so I need to be amazed at what God has done in the Bible, and at what God has done in my life. You know, there's not a life here. I, I don't know all the details of everyone, but I can tell you this. There's not a life here that isn't amazing, that hasn't had God working in it in amazing ways. So be amazed. Stop and think about it. If you aren't amazed, it's not because God hasn't done it. It's because you haven't thought about it. Stop and realize so you can be amazed. And then what we need to do when it comes to marvel is not just be amazed, but then we need to do that second step. We need to wonder, what are you up to, God? <laughs> God, what, what are you planning? What are you intending, and what's my part in it? God is doing something big, and we have a part. We saw that. That's the first chapter of Matthew. Now we see it right here at the beginning of Luke. You think God's trying to get something across? I'm doing something big. You're a part of it. Every believer is a part of it. We need to ask, well, what is it? What is God doing? You know, I thought about myself, and God, what, what are you doing with me? You know, and I have some questions. I've wondered, and I've told you all, God, it seems like the next step for us as a church is this children's minister position, and what's up, God? I have put ads at the colleges. I've talked to the guy who oversees the small groups for all of Central Christian Church. That's thousands of people. 
Another guy said, oh, I might have someone, and no, that didn't work out. I'm, what you doing, God? I'm waiting to see. God's doing something, and I just wonder, okay, why is it? What's the wait? When you're ready, we're ready. You know, I've definitely looked at Matthew and James this past year. I, I've just been blown away by what we've seen there. I don't know what you guys got out of it, but it's been good for me. <laughs> I look at Matthew and this idea of how just foundational commitment is, discipleship. It's not just believe, it's this committed discipleship. And then we get to James, and I didn't expect any of this. I thought, wow, it was just so deep and so basic for a while in, in Matthew, you know, foundational, not specific. Let's do James. Everyone knows that one's just real specific. And then we get to here's what God expects of a committed disciple. And it's this stuff like living a wise life by God's wisdom and not the world's, being humble, being patient, and what those words truly mean. Wow, God, what, what do you want me to do with that? I mean, is it just in general? You want me to? I, I know I haven't realized what it should be, and I haven't been living like I, it should be. What do you want me to do with that, God? Now, I will say this. It's possible to over-speculate and think everything's a sign. That is true, and you need to guard it against that. And I think, again, the key is, is there a thread? It's not just, oh, I see something right there, and it's got to mean this. If God's going to do something big, he knows us. There'll be that thread. There'll be a series of things where you begin to connect that. Also, you can get input from other Christians. Hey, what do you think? I, I know I can go off in crazy directions sometimes. What do you think? And then, as always, the, the framework is God's Word. It, it can never violate His Word. And every once in a while, I, I hear someone, you know, God told me this. Like, no, He didn't. Because <laughs> He's already said the very opposite in His Word. But... Begin to wonder, God is working in your life. How can you not want to know why, God? What are you up to? If you believe what we've said here today, if you believe there is a God, if you believe he, He's working to restore relationships, if you believe He works through believers, and so I have a part, how can you say, yeah, I'm not really interested in knowing what God wants to do with me? No, that's not, I'm flattered, God. But I'm really busy. You know, got some other things going on. How can you not want to know, God? This is amazing that you want to use me. What, what do you want me to do? What, what is it? What's all this mean, God? You tell me. I, I'm going to sign my name to the blank sheet right now, and you tell me what you want to put on the paper. Well, I, I always say there's a root problem that, okay, it's good to know, and maybe I didn't see this in Luke 1 to 2, and, but now that I know it, there's still an issue. I'm still not totally ready. Uh, you know, and I think the root problem is, you know, today is a sense of wonder, and have we lost our sense of wonder? In general, people today have. You know, people today don't really examine things. We're, we're just very superficial. You know, it's, it's why, again, I say all the time about Christian movies. They, they just have to come out and say, here's the message and theme of this movie, because, like, they know, well, Christians, you aren't going to get it if it's just visual, if we show and don't tell. And it's not just Christians. I mean, Kids, school, they don't dig deep into stuff. They're too busy studying for the next test to, you know, read a book and realize, what's there? We've lost that. And I think as Christians, we've lost it too. And so when it comes to the Bible, we don't wonder about it. You know, maybe we read it. Maybe we get our Caleb verse of the day and it perks us up for a while. But do we really spend some time in God's Word and really study it? I had to study for this sermon more than usual. I mean, I always spend a lot of time, but I was looking at that and this Greek word and that. And let me tell you, though, you might say, I don't know Greek. I never took Greek. I took Hebrew, but this is the New Testament, so it didn't help any. But it's some pretty simple tools, BibleGateway.com and a, another one I can tell you. You send me an email, I'll send you the one where you just go and, it, you know, and interlinear English, Greek, Hebrew. And it was really helpful, and it's pretty simple. But we've got to dig down deep. You know, we don't really examine the Bible, and we don't examine our lives very often. You know, as Plato said, or Socrates, one of them, I guess I always heard that didn't so Plato just say everything Socrates did. <laughs> the unexamined life is not worth living. I'll never forget that. The unexamined life is not worth living. Well, wow, there's a lot of people that their lives aren't worth living by that standard because we don't just step back regularly and look at our lives. You know, if anything, and here's what I've seen, and it's been true of me and I've seen it of other people, when we do examine, we basically look at how far I've come and we miss how far I still have to go. Or very often we look at me compared to someone else 
and think, all right, I've examined and I'm better than them, must be okay. <laughs> you realize that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, what was the, the key, the main idea of the Sermon on the Mount? Be ye holy, therefore, as the Lord your God is holy. Don't compare, be, be holier than you were yesterday or 10 years ago. Be holier than your neighbor. No, the standard is God. Will you ever reach it? No, but don't compare yourselves to these other things and say, I'm good. Well, same thing. If we examine it all, it's like, well, I'm so much better than I used to be. Yeah, but where am I now? So many people, and I, I talk to Christians, and I, I, I hear it sometimes, and that's why I say, the quicker you are ready to say, yeah, I got this, yeah, I'm good here, the more you need to stop and ask, do I really got this? It is so true. And when you think about it, if Satan's key weapon and tactic is deception, this is how he does it. He keeps us from looking and seeing, where am I really? You're like, yeah, you're good. Just keep saying you're good. That's all, all you need. We need to be ready for that. The root problem is we don't wonder. <laughs> the root of the root problem, I don't know what that would be, the tip of the root, the heart of the root, is we don't really want to examine when we get down to it. Because if I examine, I might have to change. Oh, that's a bad word. I don't want to change. You know, not that much. God, I want you to improve my life. I don't want you to transform my life. <laughs> and I'll tell you just how I'd like you to improve it. I've got a list, God. I'd rather not hear your list. I don't want to be transformed. But that's what God wants. The key to overcoming this root problem is to realize, first of all, that is God's intention. God is not, he didn't send Jesus just to rescue us from hell. And very often we think so. Okay, I'm forgiven. I'm going to heaven. Everything's good. Done. Check it off. Wait for it to happen. No, God's intention was to have children like him. He had to get rid of the guilt to even start the process. But then he says, okay, that's the beginning. It's not the end. Now he wants to transform us. That's why Romans 6, 10, and 11 says, For the death Jesus died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean I'm perfect, but it means sin is, is not what I live for anymore. I live for God. I'm alive to him. That's what I hear what God wants. I hear the fact that he has a plan for me. What is it, God? I want to hear about it wakes me up. That's why 2 Corinthians says, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, dwell on it, behold it, think about it, wonder about Jesus and who he is and what he's done. We are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. That's the plan. Great, you're forgiven. Okay, got that out of the way. Now let's get down to business. I want to have children like me, God says. I want to have a relationship, and that's the only way it can really be full and abundant. So I need to realize that's God's purpose all along, and I need to trust him. That's what it comes down to. When I say I really don't want to change, what it, why? Because I'm afraid what it might entail. I'm afraid it might not be as good. I'm afraid I might not like it. I'm afraid I might have to give this up. Well, the key to all that is I need to trust God. And I can. I mean, what do you know about God? What do you know about what he's done, what you see in the word, what you see in your life? I mean, what's it show? We say there's two things we can know about God. He's in control. I don't have to worry about that. Well, God, I don't know if you can handle this. And he loves me. Everything he's always done has been out of love for us. God's in control and he loves me. I can trust him. And so what do I need to do now as we close today? Look for bushes that are of a fire as Elizabeth Barrett Browning said. And that involves all aspects of the growth trial. It means read God's word and just get some general idea. Okay, God, here's how I see you working. It's not always walking on water. Wow, okay, I'll look for that. <laughs> and then I look for it in the situations of my life. God, are you doing something? What is it? Help me see it. Help me recognize it. Then talk with other believers. What's God doing in your life? I, what do you think? He, what, do you, I, what do you make of this? What's happening here? And then take off your shoes. Take off your shoes when you see that bush that's a fire, when you see God working. What's that mean? Well, it's a sign of respect and awe, but it's also a sign of submission. I'm a holy ground. Whatever happens here, this is bigger than me. Count me in, God. And then wonder, because you aren't going to know right away. 
You might say, oh God, if you just tell me right away. Well, you remember what happened at the burning bush when God told Moses right away? Uh, can't do it because of this. Can't do it because of this. Oh, there's this. Oh, there's this. God answers all its excuses. And what's he finally say? God, I don't want to do it. Send someone else. <laughs> and we just, oh God, if you just tell me from the bush, I promise. No. There's enough right now if we look for it. It's just that matter of we need to submit to it. 